Welcome back to another episode of the Brandon Smith Podcast. This week I was joined by Stuart Corso, who's a former rugby union player for Glasgow Warriors. Unfortunately, Stuart had to retire due to concussion, and this is what this podcast is all about. In fact, this is only part one of the discussion on concussion, as tomorrow night there'll be another podcast out with Nathan Parker, who made a fantastic documentary on concussion. In this podcast with Stuart, we discussed how World Rugby approaches concussion, how grassroots level is approaching concussion, is there enough education, and of course, we also had time to answer your questions for him. If you're new here, please, please do subscribe. We're so close to 500 subscribers. It means a lot to me. It's free to do and just helps you keep up to date with everything that's going on here on the Brandon Smith YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the podcast. Okay, I want to understand how you got involved in rugby in the first place because being in Wales, I don't have any choice. I've got to play rugby. I've got to love the game of rugby. Uh, what was your story up in Scotland? How did you get involved in the sport? Uh, so it must have been primary six, primary seven uh, at primary school. I was quite lucky. My head teacher at the time uh, was involved with rugby. He was one of the official, well, one of the original members of the rugby club and was a referee. So that was my first sort of taste of rugby was, you know, playing touch rugby at school. Um, we were a very football area, a very mm. football school, but um you know, it was just like one of those things our teachers were very good at giving us loads of sports to give a shot and uh, I quite liked rugby just because of the, the contact sort of stuff. So um, that's what I sort of originally attracted me into the game. So. Yeah, and uh, for, for me in Wales, as I said, I didn't have much yeah. choice, but being in North Wales, it, it's not as big. But, you know, for me, certainly, you know, my grandfather was a massive rugby fan and He'd sit me down to watch Phil Bennett play back in the 70s and Gareth Edwards said, this is how rugby should be and, yeah. and all that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I think it's interesting, a player's career, how they develop. I know that you signed on with Glasgow uh, Warriors as a youngster. Can you tell me about the process of how that came about? Uh, yeah, so um, I say when played from a local club and then we do it like districts here, so... Um, you back in the day, like you re- represent the north of Scotland, so the, the northeast um, was my area, and then you'd play against like three other regions, and then out of that, they picked the north of Scotland, and then you'd play the Midlands, and then you played for Caledonia, and then you'd play for Scotland, and then you'd go and play against Wales and usually get beat, <laughs> um, which was most of our most of the time for us. Um, and that's kind of how it worked from under 16s up to about under 21s. You know, you'd, you'd always sort of play a bit of club rugby and then you, you went through the different processes. And it was basically the same idea every year. Um, I think my when I got to about 18, 19, I went and played for the local premiership rugby team. So that was the, the top amateur side. Um, you know, I had some good coaches along the way there as well. Um, and then... Uh, I was just lucky, lucky enough to get signed on uh, with Glasgow as like an apprentice it was back then. So, um, so no, yeah, it was it was lucky to do that. Um, so yeah, so that was a rough idea on the, the process. So. Yeah, and in 2006 you got your first professional contract. That's like a dream come true for any uh, youngster who loves the game of rugby, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh no, it was it was massive. Like because. Uh, I always remember my my teacher in primary six was just like, you know, me and my friend always going about rugby and that's what we wanted to do in roll there. And it was like, no, no, you've got to think of a real job <laughs> that you want to do. And uh, so, no, to go on and actually to, to sign a contract and, and be lucky to play, you know, six or seven years, I, I'd be a professional, it was great. Um, and, you know, especially when you, you see the teacher again back, you know, mm. walking down the streets. She lives next to my parents, so... You know, it's always quite funny to have a, a chat with them, like, and you know, so yeah, you know, it's, it was massive to, to achieve your dreams. So, for sure. And I, the main reason for this podcast, I think, is to talk about concussion, and it's a massive issue in the game today. Um, I want to ask, do you remember the first concussion you had? Or you may not remember it, yeah. but were you aware that it was a concussion, or were you a yeah. bit like, I'm not, I just feel a bit dizzy, or, or do you remember where it was? Yeah, well, there was. I remember my first ever concussion when I was must have been like 16, 17. And I used to be a lot thinner back then and, yeah. and played in the centres as well. And uh, it was one of the North games against like the Northeast against the North. And I remember getting a bang to the head. And like from what my friend was saying, it was just like, every two minutes I was like to him, 
you know, are we winning? What's the score? Are we winning? What's the score? And, you know, we're getting thrashed like 60 yeah. nil or something. It was ridiculous. So that was my first experience of it. Um, and then I was quite lucky, I think, for, you know, a good probably 10 years, it yeah. didn't bother me. I never really had any head knocks. Um, it was just when I came back to Aberdeen, uh, playing, I went back to play for, for Aberdeen. And it was just, uh, I honestly can't remember too much about it. I can remember certain games, but I can't remember the first one. Um, and the the thing I do remember, though, is just that dizziness and, and feeling sick. Um, I didn't black out, so that's why I never classed it as a concussion. I was just like, oh, no, I feel a bit dizzy, I feel a bit sick, but I'm, I'm fine. Um, so that was that's how I took it to be. Um, there wasn't that much awareness about it. Is, is, is what I could remember um, and then obviously that changed the more and more um, side effects I had and the more times I was getting injured obviously the, 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 the medical staff were you know giving me a good kick in the rear end saying you know you've got to look after yourself better than what I was like so um, I want to take you back to that first concussion you mentioned there do you remember what the reaction of the coaches was the referee uh, your teammates did they suggest anything at all or was it just <laughs> no, no. On, play on? they were just like you were an idiot you were just annoying because I kept those to repeat myself yeah. uh, and just laughed it off you know mm. that was it it was just like uh, and that's why I always remember that because it was one of those things that um, everyone just took the mick at me for mm. and just like yeah, yeah, you got a fair dint in the head and you just kept basically repeating yourself and, and speaking rubbish all the time, So, uh, which was quite the norm for the next 10 years <laughs> after that, I think. So, um, But yeah, so but that was it really. Nobody said anything about it. I, I think that's interesting because I was speaking to Nathan Parker before who um, is a rugby ref and has made a documentary on concussion in rugby. And me and him, I think we're in agreement that a lack of education in what a concussion is and the protocols for it is really one of the reasons why it's so rife in rugby. Although rugby is a contact sport and it's a macho sport in a sense, so a lot of players will feel a sense if they do get injured, they want to play, if at all possible, they want to carry on playing. Do you think that's the big issue is that players may be aware that something is wrong and yet they're just like, I just want to play anyway, I'm not really going to say much about it. Yeah, if my... So I still know my doctor very well, who was mm. a club doctor, and I think that was my problem. It was a case of I, my education of the whole, you know, the injuries and side effects was, you know, zero to none. Mm. Um, and it was like one of these things that it's only a head knock, you know, you'll be fine. I want to play, you know, the, the mm. clubs put a lot of uh, time and effort to helping me and, you know, I don't want to sort of let them down. That's kind of what I was like. Uh, and it, it was that, you know, macho thing of, you know, you, you just play through injury. Um, it was a bit more old school. And I think just educating players and coaches is massive, especially now and getting it across to everyone. And it's been great. I mean, it has improved, but right. I think there's still so much more that we can do. Um, because even now, I still deal with players and coaches that are, you know, oh, you know, you'll be fine just to play another game or, you know, just go back on. It's like, no, that's that's it. Mm. You know, you've had a head knock. You're off. That's it. And um, and as a coach now, like I'm a lot more stricter mm. with uh, my players. So if I see a player with a head injury, I'm you know off. That's it. Um, and they argue with you, but like as I say, like I know the side effects. I know the mm. the problems you can have. So I'm not going to risk it. Uh, For sure. And I think yeah, that is a problem in rugby that. Players just want to play on, and it's great that they want to play on. But we were speaking about George North, me and Nathan Parker beforehand, and he had a couple of head knocks while playing for Wales, and he came back on. And my thoughts on him is that he's had so many head knocks now. What you notice when he plays is he's not comfortable to get on the ball. He hardly runs and comes in, in into the centre at all to get the ball. When he gets the ball, he tends to pass a lot more and stats back that up. He just completely lost his confidence and you do wonder if he had of been taken off properly, said, okay, take a week off, take two weeks off just to get yourself back together, to get your uh, shit sorted, then you can come back on and play later and that's okay. And at the time, he was a young lad, he's still pretty young now, he's yeah. like 26, 27, and he's got 80 caps, but the big concern for me one is that he's not playing great for Wales, but a bigger concern is 
the long-term effects that are going to have on him because he's had, what, six or seven concussions? Yeah. Four or five for Wales, a couple for Northampton, maybe one for the Ospreys. He's had a lot of concussions. Uh, and it's... It sure sets a bad example for the everyday player uh, mm. and the kids as well. I mean, uh, they say, oh, HIA, you know, we'll do a test and go back on the field. But if you've got to take a player off for a head injury, you should not be going back on. You know, you do not know what's going on inside that player's head. Um, you know, and it can affect them a lot later <clears throat> in the day, in that week. Um, as soon as we see a player that's got an injury that affects the head or anything, any of the symptoms, should be off and, and kept off, you know, and you, you just kind of wonder why, especially with the whole profile concussion, it was getting quite big for a while, that why the hell did they put him back on? Mm. You know, why why did he let himself go back? I think it's hard for the player, especially in professional sport, because, you know, they're, you're, they're your boss, they're paying your wage, and you kind of do want to go out there, but, you know, the, the coach should have been the bigger man and just being, nah, you're not going back on, and, and that's it. Um and that's what, that's what it should be, basically. Um, and whether there's independent doctors now or we do something like that, there has to be a, we have to draw the line with it. And mm. um, we can't have this half arsed message mm. of, yeah, he's had HIA, we can put him on. Nah, you know, head knock, he stays off. So that's what it should be. Do you feel you got the same message when you had to retire because of concussion? And can you explain to me the lead up into that decision? Because it can't have been an easy decision to, to have to drop. <laughs> It wasn't my decision, <laughs> you know. I, I'm a, I'm stubborn. Um, mm. My my so obviously we've been talking about this a lot more. Uh, so I've been getting in touch with my doctor and physio at the time, and then more stories come out, and I'm like, shit, I can't remember that, mm. you know. And I'm like, oh, I can't remember that either. But basically, um, the I got uh, we played Glasgow Warriors in a friendly game. And mm. um, this was, I'd, I think I'd been off for six months. I hadn't played for six months. And uh, that was my first game back. And it was a physical game. We were, you know, amateur against a professional side. Um, physical game, felt fine, got through it, no problems. I'm like, yeah, head's great. Then we played our second preseason game against Kirkcaldy, which was a league below us. Always a, you know, physical game, mm. derby, whatever. And, uh, I remember going low for a tackle and I got the knee across the side of the head mm. and uh, I can remember bits. I can remember what the guys were telling me, but I remember getting carried by one of the players to the changing room. Uh, I remember being violently sick. Uh, I remember for like two days, I was just, I was, you know, lying mm. <laughs> out of it basically. Um, at that point, I also went to see a doctor who I got some tests on my head, a scan. Uh, and he was Greek <laughs> and I always thought it was quite funny because he was so like laughing and joking but he was just like look you can go and play rugby uh, again he says you know you might get a bang in the head you might be fine he says you know you might black out you might get paralyzed or you might die <laughs> and he was just so like he says we don't know he says it's your head he says yeah. like, we just don't know what can happen and he says is it worth that risk mm. um, so I mean that was the big sort of blow of like you know, that's it's you've got to take a serious take it serious here. And uh, my doctor and physio at the time was like, "You're not insured to play anymore." There, so you've said you can't play. That's it. You're done. So, um, so yeah, it was kind of taken out of my hands a little mm. bit because, to be perfectly honest, I think and I have been naughty and played the odd old boys game and stuff every now mm. and again. Um, I would have probably still played. Um, mm. Again, probably just because of. Yeah, that's always what I knew. That's always what I was brought mm. up, and so to be just told you can't do it anymore was was pretty tough. Um, mm. So, but the side effects and all that, you know, the more I look back on it now, I should have probably stopped a lot sooner, or mm. you know, uh, I should have been a bit more honest with myself and a bit more honest with the, the with the medical team and the coaches. So, I mean, I've only got myself to blame. So. I think it's very difficult to stop, though, because growing up, I played a lot of football and, you know, I wasn't particularly good. Well, I thought I was, but I definitely wasn't. And um, if someone had told me, you know, growing up that I had to stop playing football because of an injury, but personally, I felt like I could keep going, yeah. then it's very, very frustrating to have to stop doing that. And for it to be your livelihood, pretty much everything you've known all your life, you've worked really hard to get to the position that you're in. You're obviously talented. You've gone through the Scotland age grades. 
it's very difficult to get uh, to give up on that dream in a sense um i'm wondering how did your family react and friends react to you having to stop were they supportive of the fact that you stopped or were there a few people saying oh come on you can keep going um honestly it probably can't <laughs> really recall too much i think with my close family like my partner and that it was it was pretty tough because i think i was you know i was all over the shop um i think um like my, my my temper like i wasn't i would must have been a nightmare to live with it was like a bear with a sore head um because i was getting headaches all the time i couldn't like TV, we just had a, a child as well, um, so I mean there was a lot going off, and you know I was probably just self-destructive as well. It was just one of those things that um, it was probably quite tough for me and the family at the time, um, and I just kind of probably you, you know saying that you can't play probably just escalate a lot of things as well. So probably again the typical male thing of no, I never talked about it. You know, mm-hmm. I never said anything as. Uh, to anyone, just kind of kept it to myself and was a pain in the arse to live with and a bear with a sore head for a, a long time, really. So, mm. um, But you're right, I mean, I came back to Scotland because, I say, just uh, my son was just uh, born. Um, I came back to, like, you know, I, I was paid to play, but I was also paid as a development officer. And, you know, the idea was a couple of years close to my family and then go back and, and play rugby somewhere warm. Mm. <laughs> you know, that was the, the plan. Um, and it just never materialised with obviously the, the concussions. So it was and, pretty, yeah, upset, pretty frustrating. Mm. And now you're into coaching. How's that going? You enjoying it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and who enjoys coaching? <laughs> no, like um, I must say, like the first time. So the year I got, I stopped playing. I uh, coached our second team. Uh, I quite enjoyed that because it was just mm. a, a laugh with the guys and it was back to social kind of rugby and, and then I went back and coached our first 15 the year after and to be fair it was probably the wrong thing to do um, I think because I still wanted to play like I was and I was still frustrated with myself but then the side effects that I had from rugby was still taking its toll mm. like I would be having a conversation with the guys and I would just be like Christ, I can't remember what the hell I was going to say. I can't remember what the key point was. I can't, what the hell's the object of this, you know? And I would just have a complete brain fire. Be times like I couldn't even remember half the boys' names. Mm. Like I'd just be like, you know, oi, uh, you know, silly things like that. Um, and again, uh, I guess it was a bit more, yeah, I was I'm very up and down. So I'd be very like, I was usually pretty laid back and I'm a lot more laid back, but. You know, sometimes I just fly off and folk and be like, what the fuck, you know, what are you doing? Um, and that's obviously not the way I like, I like to coach because I'd, I'd been coached by folk that were like that. Yeah. And I never wanted to be that kind of coach. I just want to be able to go up, speak, have a conversation rather than going, you know, you're bloody useless. Yeah. But I could feel that I was very much like that. Um, and I wasn't very structured or organized because uh, I couldn't do it. Mm. Like sit in front of computers to set out session plans and season plans and stuff. I had, you know, 20 minutes in front of a computer, I'd have a throbbing headache and then the circle would go around, I'd be pissed off and angry, then I'd go mm. down to sessions. And, you know, so that first two years after having a concussion and that, for me, I probably should just relax, did a bit here and there and, and, and did it that way. But, you know, I, um, I've coached since I was 17. Like I, I, I went to college um, when I left school, did sports coaching development. Uh, so from when I was 17, I've always worked in schools and worked for clubs. So I've always enjoyed working with the kids and doing that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, now I coach a women's team, went back, coached my original men's team, coached the women's team, uh, coached a lot of the local players, the kids guy, and the pathways as well. So the, the system that I went through, I go back and, and sort of a bit of coaching for that as well. And, so yeah, yeah, no, I do enjoy it, you know. Um, if that first two years of doing it, probably not the best yeah. time for me to go back into it. Uh, but now that, you know, I'm a bit more settled, I know my habits, uh, good routines again. Um, I, I enjoy it, you know. I quite, I quite like just sort of going down on the Saturday, having a bit of crack with the the guys or the girls, and you know, down on Tuesday and Thursday and stuff. So yeah, no, really enjoy it now. So. Just looking for, always looking for challenges and it's good to see players develop and, 
and getting better. So, and with the uh, sunny Scottish weather all year round, uh, you know it's going to be brilliant to be training on a uh, Tuesday and Thursday night, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, love it. <laughs> I think that was probably one reason why I absolutely hate it. We had a meeting with uh, coaches from the area, and we were like, "Yeah, we just hate it. Tuesday and a Thursday. If you're down there every single night during the week, it breaks you, you know, because." Mm-hmm. You want to have so much fun with the guys or the girls and uh, you're in a mud bath and mm. nobody enjoys it. And I saw, oh, who was it that was in the, the Scotsman or the Telegraph? Is it Jones? Yeah. He was saying that there should not be no summer rugby and it would ruin the game. And mm. fuck, he doesn't go out there and train on a Tuesday and yeah. Thursday in the middle of Scotland, you know. How many kids are like, nah, I don't want to do this. And then mm. they'll go to an indoor sport or... So, yeah, that's another gripe I have. I think it doesn't necessarily have to be a summer sport, but I think we should shut down, you know, November, December, January, February. I think we could basically call that a day and, uh, and have a change of it. And, you know, so I can wear my shorts all year round, I'll be happy. Yeah, I think that's interesting because that's, I know obviously football's completely different, but the Premier League this year for the first time brought in a winter break, uh, which I thought worked really well. One gave players a break, which is important. And even at amateur level, these players, there's some big hits in there. It's physically demanding and giving players a break might be a good idea. And obviously with the weather as well. You know, if it's freezing, you're freezing your nuts off every week. It's not fun. There's no fun in it in the end. And I think that could certainly be something to think about. Um, but as we see now with the lockdown, um, clubs, rugby clubs are not as rich as football clubs. So can they really afford to take that break? Because basically clubs at the minute are just losing money because they're not getting bums on seats. Uh, I mean, in the Pro 14, realistically, there aren't that many fans at grounds, especially here in Wales. So I don't know how much money they're really losing. But if you look at the Gallagher Premiership, where a lot of the teams are getting ten to 15,000 every week, they're losing a lot of money for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it is tough. It's, as you say, like you want the clubs to survive. And, mm-hmm. you know, it just shows you, like, the the whole COVID thing is totally showing us that r- rugby is not a professional sport, mm. really. I mean, we are still so far behind mm. uh, in terms of like football and a lot of other professional sports. And, you know, and then it's all about the player welfare and all that as well, I guess. I mean, if you think that if the, the weather was better, you're going to have more fans hopefully turning up with their family. I mean, I go into Murrayfield sometimes and... November or February, and it's absolutely Baltic, and the kids mm. are freezing. They just don't want to be there. They yeah. don't go back. You know, if you've got fine weather, get the kids along, mm. make a bit more of a you know a party atmosphere. Mm. You know, people want to drink more barbecues or whatever, more food. You know, you might not have as many games, but then if you're getting fuller crowds, you know, that's it's another way to maybe look at it. But um, you know, I think clubs have got to stop being rugby clubs. We've got to be businesses. Mm. Um, so just trying to get rugby clubs to think of other ways to get incomes, you know. Um, I guess it, you know, it's different than Premiership, but like the amateur clubs, you know, as you say, working with other sports, working with other um, small community groups, that's what they've got to do. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's rugby's in a bad place just now. I think with the whole the whole COVID has shown how weak we really are. So fingers crossed, we'll get through it. Mm. You know? And I hope we get rugby back soon. I know Super Rugby is <laughs> starting over the next few days. Um, that's going to, but obviously New Zealand only had one case pretty much in New Zealand. So we won't get into politics, but <laughs> but yeah, um, that, that is interesting that, uh, you know, they've managed to get their game back. Um, I want to chat a bit about um, Big Rig Rugby. Can you explain to the listeners a little bit about what that is, how it came about and uh, how are you involved in it? Yeah, so... Um... Like I've always did bits and bobs in camps and that, and then, um, so again, like a lot of the unions, there was a lot of cuts in like development officers and, and that kind of stuff, and, and clubs couldn't afford to take on, you know, full time staff. So, um, kind of just set up big rig rugby just to help clubs, you know, so they didn't have to employ anyone. It was a case of right, okay, you've got a budget, you've got a target where you want to hit the schools and stuff, and will come in and, and deliver to the community and help you with that. Um, so just sort of save them. And, and I mean, you know, for me as well, it was good because I was working with different clubs and different people. Uh, and I quite enjoyed that. Uh, and then also just doing like skill stuff with with um, with the kids and some adults as well. Um, so 
I kind of just sort of left in the back burner a wee bit. I, I ended up being a manager of a sports centre at the same time as it started up the big rigs. So, um, so I've just sort of been doing the bits and bobs on the side. But, you know, I, I really enjoy the coaching. That's what I prefer to do. I was ended up, you know, sitting in a sports centre and you're sitting in the office most of the time. And it's rubbish. Mm. I'd rather go out and coach and, and then, you know, have a bit of crack with the, the people. So, um, so that's more of it now. It's just to go out... Uh, work with clubs, trying to improve rugby in the community, help share ideas, um, and also I think like every club, you you've got your politics that um, you try and make those bridges between the clubs and say, well, look, I'm working for this club, man. You guys, what can you do to help each other out? Um, I think for again rugby to survive, we're going to have to do a lot more of that. Mm. We're going to have to work together. So yeah, it's just trying to be in that place where we can try try and help rugby, try and promote it. Uh, shared experience uh, and if I don't know it just sort of pass on the people that do um, and put, link people up really so that's the the idea behind it and then you just see where it goes you know that's that's it really so um, I'd hate to be stuck in an office or, mm. or do a real job so that's the so yeah try and create a job for yourself and just see where it goes like so um, but yeah no enjoy it. it's got a lot of good feedback um, I was maybe working in the prisons as well, uh, but obviously the whole COVID thing shut it down and mm. it's put a lot of things in the back burner, but um, just got to, I would say it's a new challenge and mm. trying to go online, front rows yeah. trying to work technology, as you find out, <laughs> uh, that, <laughs> then you like, it's a bit of a bloody nightmare, so uh, hopefully I'll master it by the time this is all finished. So. As always, um, to any guest who comes on, I'll put the links to everything that you're involved in in the description. Uh, anyone who's listening who wants to check it out, do check it out. Um, we're going to get on to some listener questions. Uh, lots of questions came in for yourself. A lot of Scottish people got in touch with me uh, <laughs> w- wanting to ask you um, some questions. The first question comes from uh, Stephen Goodall, who says, is the existing head test protocol fit for purpose? Should the length of time a player is sidelined be longer to ensure they are safe to return. I think we've kind of glanced over this, but I'd like to get your thoughts on the length of time and also how World Rugby are approaching uh, HIA assessments. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, like, it should just be a case of if we see a player has got a head knock, it should be just be off the pitch. And that's it. You don't come back on. Um, you know, it's been good that we've tried to, to promote it, you know, the concussion and, you know, and... and it's more aware to the people is a lot better. Uh, but I agree. I think that, you know, if it's, it's a tough one because we don't know how the concussions all come in different shapes and forms and that. So it is hard to say three weeks, I think is just a good sort of a baseline. Um, but it's about getting the honesty from the player. I think that's the massive one, mm. you know, as you say, like I was really guilty of it and just sort of be like, no, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm all ready to play. And then, you know, you'll play after three weeks and then it just makes it worse. You know, you end up being out for six months, you know, because, you know, the symptoms get so bad. So I think three weeks is right, but we need to get the honesty from the players. You know, the players shouldn't just be like, oh, no, I've got a bit of a sore head still, but I'll be fine. You know, I can play. It should be a case of, nah, mate, that's another week. Um, I think that's where we need to look at. It's, it's honesty from the players is the massive one. So Yeah, and I think it's interesting how... World Rugby have brought this in because I was speaking to Nathan before and he was we were talking about you know HIA how long has it been in the game maybe less than 10 years for sure you know it's not been there for long and you know it usually was you see the medical team run onto the pitch hold up five fingers if they get it wrong they're still playing anyway and it needs to be something where you know the players have a responsibility to be honest and Mm -hmm. say look I'm not feeling good and and take that time off because 10 minutes you know it's a very short amount of time and as we've spoken about concussion the effects of it can not only last a couple of minutes but can last days week even a lifetime and the way to protect players is say okay just take two weeks off like in the case of george north just take that time off come back when you're fit you know it's not as if you know it's two weeks out of a hopefully what 20 year career maybe nearly something like that for him and he's still pretty young so he's still got a lot of time on his hands we don't need to risk people do we no no and as you say like it, it's it's got to be down to the players and there's got to be no pressure from you know the, the clubs and that as well we've got a, they've got respect that the players you know the players want to play 
but if they're saying, you know, I'm still having symptoms, we've got to respect that and, and not play them. Um, so I think, yeah, you know, you're right. They've just got to be honest, you know, and just be clear with the clubs that I've still got the symptoms. I'm not playing. And, you know, and there's not going to be that pressure from the clubs. They should be putting them back on 10 minutes later. It's terrible, yeah. to be perfectly honest. Um, mm. And they should be mandatory. They should just be like, right, you've had a head knock. That's three weeks, you know, two mm. or three weeks, whatever. But, you know, that's it. You're having that time and you're having that time off. The next question is about um, is about children and young people within rugby. It comes from mm-hmm. Thomas Williams, not not the Welsh from half, I assume, but <laughs> it, it could be. Uh, he, yeah, asked, <laughs> he asks, uh, should tackling be restricted to only over 14s to reduce the impact of concussions on children and young people? No, I think um, what we need, again, is the education part yeah. of it. I think we need to make sure that our, it's a gripe of mine actually is that you'll do your level one, your level two, and that's it. You know, you don't really have to do any CPDs. You don't have to really get any better. You just have to pick things up as you go along. And I think it's very important that, you know, if you were in a, a work environment, you know, you have to keep getting better all the time to make sure you keep your job. It should be the same with the coaching. We should be attending CPDs. You should be learning how to teach the tackle better. I think mm. that, you know, you know, coaches should have to attend sessions where they're like, right, this is how we make a tackle. This is how you coach how to make a tackle. This is a process. Because there's still so many kids that are learning how to tackle completely wrong, you know, mm. even from just lining up to a player, putting their head in the wrong place. Yeah. So I think, you know, still keep it at the same ages, but we need to improve, you know, the quality of product. You know, coaches have got to be better at coaching these mm. things. Uh, and again, that should help, you know, prevent... Uh, concussion, you know, because they're not putting their head in the wrong place. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's keep it the same age, but again, we've got improved coaching. The coaches have got to be better. Uh, it's great. We need volunteers, mm. but, you know, they've got a responsibility to those players to uh, make sure that they're safe. And I think education, as you said, is the big thing that one players know how to tackle properly because. No, in so many games, even in professional level, you know, I remember Lee Halfpenny getting a concussion a few years back where he got his tackling technique completely wrong, got a knee to the head and was flat out. Yeah. And it was just an awful technique. I mean, I'm not a professional player or anything, but, you know, it was bad technique. And what we're seeing as well today in the modern game, which we maybe didn't see 10, 15 years ago, is players are tackling high to try and dislodge the ball. We've seen Ireland do that very successfully uh, under Joe Schmidt where players would go in for the rip or hold the player up. And uh, in the World Cup, we saw a lot of high hits, a lot of red cards, of course. But it, it is an issue that World Rugby needs to think about. And they have spoke about lowering the tackle. But in my opinion, I just think that heightens the risk again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put your head closer to knees, to hips, to elbows, to ankles, to feet. I personally would be completely against it. Yeah, I think they're making a, a mountain of molehill with that. It's a case of when I got injured, it was all, well, I remember the couple of concussions I did get was because I went low. And that was my thing, of, you know, going low. But um, yeah, so forcing kids to go lower, it doesn't really work. We need to teach the kids how to, you know, use our footwork to get better, get closer, keeping your head to the side. That's what's more important rather than trying to lower the height. If kids are going higher, you know, again, it's just making sure that they're they're being safe. I mean, we'll never, there will always be those good players, somebody coming in at a great angle, you know, that there is going to be a, you know, a moment where you're going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But, you know, hopefully with better coaching, better technique, better education, we, we should hopefully cut these down. Um, that, you know, that's the main thing. Uh, and neck strength as well. We don't, I feel bad for like, a lot of the younger coaches. Uh, they do the youth stuff is that we've got so much things that you want to coach the kids but like you know doing simple like neck exercises and stuff again which is again something that can help prevent it's not we're going to stop it but again it's just something that can help uh, prevent kids from getting injured and that's what we want we obviously don't want kids to get injured we want them to enjoy the game and I think it's important that we get the balance right between rugby as a contact sport at the end of the day and a lot of us enjoy watching it because we see the big hits. You know, I love watching the Samoans and Fijians. One, because of the way they play and the way they put some hits in. <laughs> like, I'm glad I'm not playing against them. That's all I can say. I mean, they I are big boys. He was my favourite back in the day. 
No. So, I used to support Wasp, so Trevor Liotta, uh, like just a little tank, just coming out and smashing boys. Eh? That was, uh, I always used to love watching him play. Um, so that was me. I used to like, right, just come out, just mm. forearm, straight in, get them early. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it is a contact sport and it gets so many people like, oh, we should just ban rugby. It's just like, that's just completely stupid. Yeah, it's ridiculous. You know? It's just like, um, we've just got to be more educated and, and mm. pass on knowledge. Yeah, and final question for you is um, about grassroots level. Are grassroots clubs educated enough? And if they aren't educated enough on concussion, what should be done to educate them? Um, I mean, Scottish rugby is quite uh, good. We've got like a rugby right program. So it used to be delivered by the SRU staff. And then now you have to do it online. So basically, you know, you're a coach. You have to read everything, you know, tick the boxes, the right answers. So, you know, there's a big focus on concussions for a few years um, and child protection. And that So it is there. Uh, but whether people choose to actually read it and listen to it is, mm. is a different thing. So, um, yeah, I think we just need to, I mean, kids now, maybe we need to go directly to the kids. So maybe it's a case of being better on social media, like mm. doing the documentaries, showing the kids the documentaries, um, like Nathan's done, or making something a bit more short and sharp for the kids. I think I mean, that's the way we have to go because um, maybe we're still getting a lot of the coaches, which are a bit the old school thinking. Um, so maybe we have to cut them out and, and say to the kids, like, look, this is what you've got to look for. Um, and how we do that is, you know, social media is probably the way forward on that, on that aspect. And I also think there's a responsibility for the professional players that they may really, really want to play on. But if a young child sees, oh, he's got knocked out, but he's carried on, then why can't I do it? And obviously, you know, the players... You know, they want to play, one, because they're getting paid, and two, because it's their job and everything like that. But if the children are seeing a player get knocked out, as I said, carrying on, it doesn't exactly say to them, OK, I need to go off, I need to look after myself. And I think pressures from parents and things like that, who may be a bit more old school, be like, oh, stop being a whip, carry on, you're fine. It is not the way to go because, you know, we've seen so many uh, players, um, you know, retire and then having really bad... Uh, brain problems and issues around that memory and you know dementia and things like that and we've seen the links I think Shane Williams did a really good documentary as well on it and highlighted the issues and basically one of the um, doctor said it's like boxing you know it's like being punched in the head every week uh, and that's the impact that it's having on your body yeah yeah no, definitely. I think it's got to start from the top with the professionals. As you say, like we, we monkey see, monkey do. I mean, mm. uh, Johnny Wilkinson, the way he kicked all the kids used to stand like he did, mm. you know, uh, out the back door. Sonny Bill Williams, God, he does that, I'll do that. Oh, George North got a head knock and he goes back on the field. Mm. That's fine, I can do that as well. And, you know, we've got a responsibility as professional players to make sure that we're setting good examples and, you know, even if it annoys their clubs or, or coaches, they've got to be the bigger person and be like, no. Nah. Because, I mean, all the information is there. We've seen what's happening now that, you know, there's no excuses. So um, I think, say, start from the top, probably educate the kids as well, you know, the social media thing, and then hopefully somewhere in the middle we'll, we'll get there. Um,